Thank you, ma'am. Well, I say that is I have the honor of uh, introducing my guru, you know, Professor Puri. And uh, well, everybody knows, but uh, some of the people from pediatrics and some residents have joined. So for the sake of that, we are introducing. And uh, if you look at him, uh, Diane, or sometimes, you know, we say that father of uh, pediatric surgery research in the world. So he was with the Children Research Center, Our Lady's Hospital for Sick Children at uh, Kremlin, Dublin. Presently, sir is a consultant pediatric surgeon and director of surgical research at the Beacon Hospital, which is again connected to the university hospital, the, the best university, hospital, university of the Ireland. He has been a secretary of International Board of Pediatric Surgery Research, past president of World Federation of Association of Pediatric Surgeons, past president of European Pediatric Surgeons Association, UPSA, past president of World Federation of Association of Pediatric Surgeons uh, Foundation, was the editor-in-chief of the Pediatric Surgery International and is an, on the editorial board of the several journals, you know, international journals, not only the pediatrics, pediatric surgery and research, pure research journals as, as, well, as well. He has been the research director of research and the president of the National Children Research Center uh, situated at the Our Ladies Hospital for Sick Children in Dublin. This is one of the single largest pediatric research institution in uh, Europe, I can say, you know, the, not only the hospital, but also the center. And he was a former member of the board of directors of the Health Research Board of the Ireland and the Children Medical Research Foundation of Ireland, which raises the funds for the uh, Children Research Center. The biggest contribution of SIR has been various things. You know, you look into anything, you know, whether it is a neonatal surgery, critical care, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, Hirschsprung disease. You think of any of the diseases in the spectrum of the pediatrics and pediatric surgery, you will get him. But the path breaking and the most important the innovations and the research which was in the VUR, vesicoretic reflux, with the development of the string procedure followed by various techniques, the various materials used for that. And in fact, uh, there is no country in the world which has not sent the samples to him. You know, I used to see the samples used to come from South America, Africa, everywhere. And the fellows also, not just a sample, not just the patients, even the fellows. You know, I think uh, there's no country which has not visited. There's no country which has, uh, doesn't have a pediatric surgeon which has not been trained by him or who has not worked with him in the hospital or in the research center. And uh, I know that there are people in Japan itself, at least 30 or 40 people are there who are heading the heads of the institutions and the universities right now at the moment. And uh, looking to the Hirschsprung disease research, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, forget anomalies. And uh, I don't want to go into the number of publications and all. He will have hundreds in a year itself, you know, cited over 20,000, 4,000 times in a peer-reviewed articles, published uh, more than 10 monograms and 147 chapters. Uh, sir was quoting about the, the articles from the Lancet, BMJ, British Medical Journal, Nature Genetics, a whole lot of things, you know. And we used to read, and the whole world reads the neonatal surgery book, uh, which is uh, his baby. And uh, he has not just the kind of the surgeon, you know, because, you know, we used to see him operating on the babies and the whole world will throng on to the uh, Dublin, Ireland, come over to get its surgery done. And as far as the research, you know, I used to see him at four o'clock or five o'clock when the entire Ireland used to sleep, he will come and sometimes open. You know, there used to be competition between Indians, Japanese and Professor Puri and generally he wins the race. You know, he'll be the first person to enter the campus, get the things done, finish all his research work, administration and go back to the hospital at nine on the dot. You know, that was the inspiration we used to get from him. Uh, he has trained many, many people and uh, different countries and uh, many of his students are uh, professors, heads of the department, vice chancellors, department heads, and the living testimony is here, sir, uh, is my Guruji. So everywhere, any part of the world, he's there, you know. And he has many honorary fellowships, including American Surgical Association, American Academy of Pediatrics, American Pediatric Surgical Association, Canadian Association of Pediatric Surgeons, Japanese Society of Pediatric Surgeons, Argentinian, Austrian, Canadian, Zek, Croatia, a whole lot of things, you know, the long length of things, you know. And he had the People Year of the Award, Ireland. It is like our highest civilian award of the India. 
and uh, prestigious Denny yeah. Brown gold medal, which is like a Nobel Prize for us in pediatric surgery, you know, British Association of Pediatric Surgeons. And Rebin Medal of the European Pediatric Surgeons Association, College Medal of Royal College of Surgeons, Wyland, has been visiting professors of many universities around the world. And uh, with this, sir, it's my honor and privilege and pleasure to welcome you. You visited many countries in the world, but you know, whenever you come to us, you bring a lot of cheer, inspiration, and then we always get inspired. The youngsters get inspired. You know, I was inspired because he, he visited us and then, you know, I had some inclination to the research and then I had to join him. And, uh, and one good thing about him that if you go to his office, you will find everybody's photograph. The first time when I met him in front of them, I was just wondering all these Chinese, Japanese, who are they? You know, I didn't know that he had such a big uh, fellows all over the world. And then one fine day he said, tomorrow your photo will be here and it was there. So that's something we look forward for you, sir. Always a pleasure. Welcome to India, Delhi. And as usual, we cherish. And we continue to see you. Uh, whenever you come to India, please come inspire us and bless us. Welcome, sir. While they're getting slides ready, uh, Professor Sirio asked, thank you very much for all the kind words. And uh, I feel very proud to see you as director of this prestigious institute, institute where I was a houseman <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> and, uh, and Professor Bajpai, thank you very much for your kind words. I'm delighted to be here. And uh, sorry, can you ask that? Yeah, yes. And there's a pointer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, the title I've chosen, I, as uh, Professor Sinivas mentioned, I've been interested in a number of uh, conditions in children, but what I've chosen today is mainly to give an example to, especially to young people, that if you, you know, choose an area of uh, research interest and, uh, and how deep you can go into it. And so, you know, and I share with you also the problems as well as the successes that come along with it. And, uh, and I, I've chosen a topic where I've been interested for over 40 years. Uh, can you remove this? Yeah, click, click that. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. 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 I don't know whether you can see it clearly. The, Ireland is a very small country. Uh, it's, it's, uh, in fact, now it's the only English speaking country in the whole of EU which is uh, with the Brexit, you know, caused a lot of problems with the UK, but brought a lot of uh, advantages for Ireland 
because now uh, we are the only English speaking country. We have the, uh, almost all of the headquarters of all big American multinationals are in Ireland. And the uh, only country in EU where the economy is doing extremely well still, even during the time of reception. Uh, it has a population of 5 million. Uh, although when I started in Ireland and nearly 50 years ago, the population was 3 million. And uh, Ireland has changed a lot. Well, uh, to give you an example, when I started in this 325 bad children's hospital, I was the only foreign medical graduate. Now nearly 40% of the people working in the children's hospital were not born in Ireland. When I started working in children's hospital, uh, the CEO of the hospital, the, uh, the director of nursing, and each and every uh, ward head nurse was a nun. We don't have a single nun in the children's hospital. And the third thing is our prime minister at the moment is of Indian origin. And I know him since he was four years old. His father was a pediatrician, well, was training as a pediatrician while I was training as a pediatric surgeon. And uh, things was, Ireland was such that he could not get a job as a consultant pediatrician and decided to start GP practice. And his son, Leo Varadkar, whom I taught in medical school, uh, became the prime minister, is the prime minister of Ireland. So this is a lot of changes in Ireland. Now, I, I was delighted to see your children's hospital today because, uh, you know, uh, in, certainly in Ireland, children is a very top prior priority. And that's so also in many other Western countries. I remember uh, uh, visiting uh, the old uh, block of chil children's hospital here and how dark the rooms used to be. And it's was a pleasant sight to see today, the new children's hospital. And uh, I was delighted that. And so we, at the, uh, currently we have three children's hospital in Dublin. Uh, and in 2024, they will all move to this site, uh, which would be the most costly hosp <coughs> children's hospital in the world is going to be cost 2 billion euro to have built this uh, uh, children's hospital in Dublin. You know, even in the United States, there's no children's hospital which is costly. This is the most costly project, developmental project that Ireland has taken. And, uh, and we, we have a separate building. Uh, uh, we, can you hear me? Yeah. We have a separate building uh, standalone for uh, research and development attached to this building. But I, I think I'm most proud to show you this building where I've spent most of my uh, time, you know, uh, uh, in this place where I was, a, as Professor Sinevas mentioned, I was the director of research for 20 years and then president for a number of years. And also I was the only a member of the Health Research Board in our Health Research Board is a body which uh, uh, decides the allocation of funds for medical research in Ireland. And I've been the only periodic surgeon or pediatrician ever appointed to this board. And certainly uh, when I started, the allocation of funds which children research used to be 3%. And when I finished after five years, it was 11% of the fund. And this building, you know, we've had 80 periodic surgeons who have come to, uh, to train. You know, these are periodic surgeons like Professor Srinivas when he came, they were already periodic surgeons who just came to spend anything from two to four years 
doing periodic surgical research. And that has been a, for me, uh, he mentioned the wall there, you can, some of you can see, uh, there's, sorry. Yeah, and the, the greatest highlight of my career during the last certainly 40 years has been working with these 80 fellows. I've had hundreds of residents who worked with me in the hospital. But these fellows have been my uh, second family, as my wife calls it. And they, uh, I, I must say, I've learned a great deal from them, uh, not only about research methodology and so on, but also about life. You know, we've spent many long hours in the lab, you know, uh, working together, but the, uh, the, the all the mutual respect working together, together is brought a very close bond. Uh, each and every fellow knows the other one. Uh, and uh, to, uh, as he mentioned, 36 of them are from Japan and uh, 26 of my fellows are now full professors in various universities. Uh, 11 of them are uh, additional prof uh, uh, associate professors, number of them, head of department uh, and uh, uh, Professor Srinivas probably occupies the most uh, 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 prestigious position as director of this institute. This is just to show you an example of, uh, you know, in uh, uh, the middle, the guy who was getting the, uh, his PhD, uh, uh, doing his PhD convocation it, uh, Takashi Doi, he's the professor in Osaka, but right from the left, you, they were all at the same time registered for uh, P P PhD or doing PhD. Now, Fujifara from Japan, uh, Flo from Frankfurt, where he's a periodic surgeon. Jan is in Leipzig, where he's a periodic surgeon. Piotr is from Poland. He is a periodic urologist in Dublin. And Manuela Hunjikar, she is a periodic urologist in Zurich. And Bali Kotasi, he is a periodic surgeon, a periodic urologist in Stockholm, Karolinska Institute. Now, I'm going to briefly talk about translational research uh, of the background and then give you a few examples and then go on to talk about my journey in recycled reflux. The role of research in advancing the state of medical care is well uh, recognized. Research is important to the advancement of medicine, we all know. Without research, we would not have evidence of what works best and what doesn't work. Without research, we would not have the possibility of developing new pharmaceutical, new medical devices, new uh, surgical procedures, and so on. And research into children's disease is a vital factor in the development of health care of children, needs of children anywhere in the world. The future of child health care as well as the future of academic periodic specialty depends greatly on the scientific advances that we make. So what is translational research? This is the definition I put in here from the National Institute of Health. The process of applying ideas insights and discoveries generated through basic science, scientific inquiry to the treatment or prevention of human diseases. It, it is an effort to build on sci basic scientific research to create new therapies, medical and surgical procedure, medical devices, and so on. Excellence in modern periodic clinical practice cannot be provided except in the context of basic science research-led inquiry and is translational into clinical practice. As many of us know, a few surgeons leave a permanent legacy. They may leave a few well-trained residents 
and some thousands of satisfied patients, but only a handful will alter any aspect of our art, craft, and science in a significant way. And I'm sure if you look around, you'll know that again and again, it's been proven that those people who come up with more relevant ideas and a sustained output of scientific publications have spent a part of their training in research position. Not having a spell of in laboratory, in laboratory research restricts one's mind, certainly in my situation. I was very fortunate I was introduced to research very early in my career. Uh, and it was when I was doing my master's in Maulana Azad, I came across Professor Nigam, who was the youngest surgeon appointed as professor of surgery in Maulana Azad, but he became blind, uh, completely blind all of a sudden. Uh, and he did not, because he did not know that he had diabetes. And uh, he had been trained in England. So he went back for a year uh, to be able to work as a blind su surgeon. And when he came back, he still had a number of research projects, uh, which he had got funding from, you know, uh, 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 Indian Medical Research Council, ICMR. And one of the projects was on liver transplantation in dogs. And uh, here was a man who was completely blind. And I used to do the liver transplantations for him with another uh, surgeon, uh, Dr. Pandey. And then, uh, he would come at, after I finished it, he would come at 8.30 in the night with his driver holding his finger and palpate the dog and, you know, and I would, I was so impressed by this man. I would go there at three in the morning and do blood gases on the dog. And the, my first paper ever was on liver transplantation. And I, I learned from this person the determination and how, uh, how interested he was. And he worked till his retirement. And, uh, and every Thursday, I used to go for two hours to his uh, house to read journals to him. And uh, I would arrive in his house, you know, I, I, I would offer a glass of Coca-Cola, the door will close. And for two hours, I will read uh, journals, you know, the uh, annals of surgery and, you know, and I will probably some, some evenings I will read maybe 130 pages like, a, and would, you know, didn't think anything was going into my head, but I've got, I was just reading. And the next day he would be do, taking a tutorial and would say, uh, you know, to, men to mention like this, Dr. Puri, you remember we were discussing this yesterday. I wouldn't have a clue. But, uh, you know, that was, uh, so this was a man who in, uh, impressed, and that's my second uh, uh, person who introduced me to research uh, was in Great Ormond Street, in Lo London, uh, Mr. Nixon who every Thursday used to give me a complete day off to work in the laboratory of a woman called Barbara Smith, who was a pathologist and a world expert in silver screening. And I would go and cut sections and learn. So I, that's why I said I was very fortunate that I was introduced to basic science research very early in my career. Now, what about a, a Coming to translation research, I'm going to, you know, our specialty of periodic surgery and periodic urology has been criticized by those that feel we have done very little ourselves, but have merely adopted discoveries of others in field of ad adult surgery. 
the many outstanding contributions have been made to our specialty by distinguished periodic surgeons from all over the world. I have today selected a short list of periodic surgeons who made an outstanding contribution to other disciplines in medicine, which I'm going to share with you. This is my personal list. I'm sure I, may, I may miss somebody. And I'm going to talk about them briefly before I go on to talk about uh, where you are. And the number one of the top of the list for me is Robert Gross from Boston Children's Hospital. He, he, he introduced the concept of uh, periodic cardiac surgery. In fact, the modern periodic cardiac surgery is based on this work of this Robert surgeon. And I also, I want to give you an example of the, each one of the examples I give you have, have done uh, experimental work before clinical, you know, that's why I'm in it, giving you two examples of translational uh, uh, research, which is from a, a lab to the bedside. So Gross did many first, you know, if it's a ligation of PDA, uh, division of vascular ring, closure of the aortic pulmonary window. But in my opinion, his greatest uh, contribution was this arterial homographs that the homographs that he uh, in, initially used to, you know, to replace coarctation of aorta. But if you just think of how many these graphs that we used in vascular surgery or cardiac surgery, this was all due to this periodic surgeon. Another periodic surgeon you may have heard, uh, Judah Folkman, who completely discovered a new field of called field called angiogenesis. He, he was the youngest uh, professor of uh, surgery appointed to Harvard Medical School at the age of 32. And he introduced this tumor in, uh, angiogenesis factor. Initially, when he published his first paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, there was a lot of criticism from pe people. But by the time of his death, you know, there, there were uh, over 1,000 labs which were using or doing research on angiogenesis. And they were, uh, he died quite, you know, when I say young, he died in his 60s. Uh, 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 and that too of a, unfortunately, of a severe asthmatic attack while he was coming down the plane. You know, he was going, uh, going to give a lecture. And while he was coming down in the plane, he had a very bad attack of asthma and died. And uh, at the time of death, 1.2 million patients worldwide were receiving anti-angiogenic therapy for cancer. And he was a periodic surgeon. Another name was Michael Gorder from South Carolina. He developed the uh, PEG or the percutaneous endoscopic uh, gastrostomy. And if you just think of it, there are 250,000 PEGs are inserted annually in United States of America alone. And 90% of, over 90% of these are done in adults. Another contribution of periodic surgeon to uh, other disciplines. Michael Harrison, many of you have heard, you know, he introduced the whole area of fetal surgery. You know, not only the uh, fetal surgery itself, but I think his major contribution has been to, you know, to give us insight into the fetal physiology or pathophysiology from San Francisco. And these are some of the milestones I've mentioned, as you can see in this slide. including, you know, open repair of myelomeningocele, fetal repair. You know, a lot of people have known. I mean, I was talking to a guy, Martin Muley from Zurich. He has published his, his uh, 
it sees about over 300 patients and there are a number of others and many other uh, of you know many people that she trained like alan flake you know from philadelphia who's developed a artificial womb at the moment i i met him last month only in october and they are now doing experimental where they'll be able to uh, two things, artificial placenta and the womb, you know, where they'll be able to uh, have these very tiny, tiny babies, you know, mature in, in, inside the womb. And the other is Tony Atala from a lot of work uh, on this uh, uh, fetal uro urological conditions. The next is the uh, J. Vacanti in uh, uh, I can't get rid of this, something coming on my slide, but not to worry. Uh, many of you have heard of Joseph J. McCanty, the periodic surgeon from Mass General. And uh, he started the whole field of regenerative medicine or tissue engineering, you know. And he, in, in, in his early days, he was involved in liver transplantation and there was a shortage of uh, donors and he went to a, a, a biomedical engineer in Mass General, a guy called Professor Langer, uh, with the idea of creating artificial organs by using a biodegradable polymer scaffold to develop sh uh, shape and tissue. He recently gave a, you know, a guest lecture at UPSA, and I learned that he has more, more than 80 patents. I think the major uh, revolutionary research work in tissue engineering was when he created this uh, a, 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 a human ear in, in the nude mouse. And there was a BBC documentary on that in, in 1992, 93. And uh, I think that brought in a lot of research interest in this area, a lot of investors uh, putting money into uh, this research. And now, uh, as you can see, the regenerative medicine itself is a specialty and a lot of, uh, you know, human application of tissue engineering, many, many, almost every, uh, it, it, along with the stem cells. And I know Shilpa is involved in doing stem cell research work. It's become a new field now. And finally, I'm going to talk about uh, my area of interest. Uh, in, in Dublin as a research center, we have certain, naturally you can't do research in everything. We have certain areas of research, uh, programs of research, birth defects, cancer genetics, gastrointestinal infections, uh, obesity, uh, immunity and inflammation. And then we have a big clinical uh, uh, research unit. I have headed the birth defects uh, program for over 30 years. And of the birth defects, you know, we have experimental animal research, such as nitrogen induced congenital diaphragmatic hernia. In, in diaphragmatic hernia alone, I have over 250 publications in this topic. We have adiamycin induced bacterial association, cadmium induced omphalocele, and molecular biology research has been in Hirschsprung disease, hydronephrosis, and vesicoureteral reflux. Now, as, as I said in the beginning, the message here, I want to give it to you. They have chosen one area where I had been working for the last 40 years. But when you get go deeper and deeper, from one idea comes to another, and you will see that how, uh, I would say successes, but also there are some problems, but how you handle those problems. And, and especially that's the message I want to give it to young people who are you know, contemplating doing translation research. But psychoureteral reflux is the most common urological problem in children. It, it, you know, occurring in about 2% of uh, children. I mean, in fact, if you were to take out vesicoureteral reflux from the nephrologist, they would have very 
less uh, else to do. It's recognized as a major cause of chronic renal failure. And this is a UK renal registry report uh, uh, 2020. As you see, the one third of uh, patients uh, who, who were in end stage renal disease in UK, the cause was reflux or renal dysplasia. Similarly, the same UK renal registry, uh, uh, one third of patients with hypertension in children, the cause was renal scarring. And also in the parenchymal injury or renal scarring or nephropathy occurs early in the vast majority of children before three years of age. This is a study from our own institution in infants under the age of one year after the first urinary tract infection. And you'll see 549 consecutive children uh, with reflux, infants with reflux, uh, and 27% uh, of them showed uh, evidence of renal parenchymal damage or renal scarring. But what's worrying is about nearly half of them had moderate to severe renal scarring. This is another study from our own institution uh, with patients uh, with high grade reflux, grade four and five, 774 children. And, and as you see, again, about nearly 40% of children show renal dysplasia or re re renal uh, damage or renal reflux nephropathy. And like the other study, nearly half of them having moderate to severe damage. And in this study on multivariate analysis, the most important predictors for renal functional abnormalities were grade five reflux, patients over age of one year, and those who have bladder bowel dysfunction. There are three most important mechanisms for, the, uh, for renal scarring. Reflux of infected urine with interest, causing interference interstitial inflammation and damage, high-grade sterile reflux uh, uh, causing damage because of mechanical factors. And lastly, patients who are born with congenital dysplasia or congenital reflux nephropathy. Naturally, we, we, the first two, if you can you know, stop reflux early, you can prevent further damage, but also in the third category of congenital dysplasia, where we cannot do, cure them, but certainly you can prevent further damage if you can treat them early. So there are various options for treating uh, uh, psychoureteral reflux, as you can see in this slide, and I'm mainly going to talk to you about uh, how I became interested in endoscopic treatment. Uh, well, this is just to show you, in my opinion, the, the, the three most important uh, Observational studies which have been done in, in relation to reflux are the Birmingham uh, uh, reflux study, Toronto Sick Children reflux study, and international reflux study. And all these have shown that, uh, it, 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 especially the grade three, to, uh, grade three and four, many patients continue to have reflux even after five years of observational therapy. And not only that, but some of them go on to develop new reflux, uh, new renal scars. Now, I, I uh, became interested in, in uh, endoscopic treatment when I was working with these two gentlemen. And in the, in the center is Mr. Nixon. Mr. Nixon, I was working with him and we used to have an operating day on Wednesday in Great Ormond Street. And the next door, for the uh, uh, Mr. Ian, Ian, Ian Williams used to do his uh, urology, and I'll see him every week. He'll do one or two reimplantations. And when I came to work with Barry O'Donnell, uh, again he will do a reimplantation every uh, every week. And I'll see them opening the abdomen and 
mobilizing the ureter and then fixing the ureter, uh, you know, uh, to the bladder. And I said to Barry, and you know, it should be possible to uh, inject some material under the uh, submucosal ureter and to, uh, you know, endoscopically, we should be able to stop the reflux. And he said, good idea. So I went on to write a, a research grant and we produced this reflux in the piglet, as you can see, and stopped it. it sent, the middle picture shows you, we stopped the reflux after injecting a, a Teflon. And the Teflon idea I got was because the ENT surgeon used to inject Teflon uh, to treat dysphonia or vocal cord uh, paralysis. And the last slide shows there, there, there was no obstruction. So we published these two simultaneous paper in British Medical Journal. Uh, 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 one was, first one was the experimental, uh, exp correction of experimentally produced vesicular reflux. Uh, and the second one was thir 13 children or 13 girls we treated uh, endoscopically. So after this, there was a lot of interest. You know, the pe people became very much interested. It's uh, just a 10 minute procedure. You could, you know, uh, crack the reflux uh, endoscopically. And uh, in uh, 1990, I published my personal uh, intermediate results in 91 children in the Lancet. A, a single author uh, publication. But soon after that came the problems, as you'll see here. Ian Aronson from South Carolina, he published a very, uh, I don't know, I still find it difficult how this paper could be published. It's only on two uh, animals, but they showed distant migration from Teflon. And once I saw this paper, I, I started worrying that now there's a very little chance that uh, it will be used in America because this paper had been published showing distant migration to lungs and brain. Uh, and the, the, I, I, I had a new uh, uh, fellow started with me at that time, uh, Dr. Mia Kita, who's a professor of periodic urology in, in Tokyo now. Uh, and we did a very extensive studies of in a multi-series, you know, in dogs and uh, mini pigs, uh, where we injected not only a, to intra, uh, sub uh, ureter injection, but we also gave it to the uh, veins and all, and we could not show any evidence of migration. We, in another publication, we even injected into the carotid artery and again, we could show the particles there, but there was no surrounding damage, you know. But having uh, Ian Aronson's paper caused, uh, you know, a lot of worry among the people that you know, this distant migration, even though we try to give examples that distant migration occurs from the intravenous tubing that we use, you know, from breast prosthesis or, you know, penial processes, all the processes, the, uh, occur. but you know, as, as you know, in, uh, they mentioned that his, his message in his uh, publication was that should be not used in children. So the other tissue augmenting substances started coming up. Uh, I was even in, invited to Boston Children's Hospital as a visiting Harvard professor to inject autologous chondrocytes, because as I mentioned earlier on, Jay Vacanti and Tony Atala and were taking, uh, they, uh, they were doing this tissue engineering, they were taking a cartilage from the ear and harvesting chondrocytes, but the problem with chondrocytes was they become hard and, and it didn't work. But during the uh, at same time, I also knew that for the last couple of years, 
Uppsala group in Sweden had been experimenting on deep flux or the dextranomer uh, hyaluronic acid. And uh, I think the big paradigm shift in endoscopic treatment of EUR happened in 2001 when deflux was approved by the FDA in America. You know, once that happened, there was worldwide acceptance that deflux is an effective tissue augmenting substance. A lot of people started using the, uh, this for all grades of VUR. But the two other most important uh, happened it was in 2001, when the, it got approved by FDA, I was invited by a QMED, the manufacturer of Deepflex, if I could do a, a clinical trial on 100 patients, 50 patients over a three year period. But we, we did 111 patients within a year and published our results in, periodic uro in Journal of Urology in 2003. And the second most important development was in 2002, the Journal of Urology published 80 classic papers, which had been published in the last century and 100 years and made a big impact on urological practice. And our original paper published in BMJ was accorded a classic uh, paper in, in this list uh, of Journal of Urology in 2002. And at this stage, <laughs> as Professor Baj before mentioned, the, I, I, I was invited to many countries. We conducted three international workshops in these three years uh, in Dublin, attended by, including periodic urology, 126 American periodic urologists. And also I conducted 18 workshops in uh, 11 other countries uh, or cities around the world during this period. Now, this is a very simple technique. Takes about 10 minutes. <coughs> but the success or failure depends on the placement of the needle. You know, if you place the needle properly and you get that nipple or volcano effect, you know that you have stopped the reflux. And Right from the beginning, we have used the uh, uh, all grades of reflux, uh, high, high uh, grades of reflux, grade three to five. Uh, as you can see, a few more examples. And this is a, I hope it worked. Yeah, as I said, the placement of the needle is important. I still use the flexible needle, which is called Puri catheter and made by stores. Some people use a rigid catheter, but the advantage with the flexible catheter is that you can, you know, rotate the, if, if you find the mound is not appearing in the proper place, you can rotate it and I'll show you an example. Uh, the most important thing is that uh, you, you should be able to see this, that, that the mound is, as you can see here, and you know that you have stopped the reflux in this patient. This is another example, grade five reflux, bit white orifice. And again, uh, I, th mainly I'm showing you this example because it's possible to rotate the needle if you find the mound, as you can see, it's appearing more to the middle side and uh, you, you don't have to take out the needle. I mean, there are a lot of hit and double hit being introduced by the Americans, but in my opinion, it's all gimmick. You don't need to do, uh, you know, uh, but as you see nicely. So this is a, a uh, 10 year results we published uh, uh, in uh, 1500 patients 
Hi, I have been calling you only, like literally. I was searching for your number. Two thousand three hundred forty-one ureters. Uh, I'm going as on leave from see, tomorrow. As you can see, ninety-six percent of patients so, uh, are grade three to five. So I'm going to have to do rounds for you. And eighty-seven, we were able to stop the reflux with a single injection. Some of them needed a second or third injection. Uh, and uh, uh, on a follow-up, we were able to show no no evidence of obstruction. Now, there are two important goals when you're treating reflux. One is to prevent renal damage. The other is to pr uh, prevent uh, recurrence of febrile unit tract infections. So we looked at the uh, incidence of febrile unit tract infections in our patients who had been successfully treated endoscopically with re reflux. These are 1,271 uh, consecutive children, uh, actually, 5.7 or 73 developed febrile unit tract infections. And in 34 patients who had two or more febrile unit tract infections, we were able to do a widening cystourethrogram. And as you'll see, there's only four of them had recurrence, three had neocontralateral, and 23, which all of them were girls, had evidence of voiding dysfunction. So you have to keep in mind if, if somebody has a recurrence of, a, a, or if you have febrile unit tract infections, that uh, to investigate voiding dysfunction. Some control issues, especially in America, they still f f find that the best patients to treat are grade two and three. We have treated, uh, some people are reluctant to use grade three or four, although we have always uh, treated, this is a study showing grade four and five patients in our uh, series, 851 consecutive children. Uh, you'll see, uh, as you can see, 90% grade four, 10% grade five, and but in 70% of patients, even with grade four and five, we were able to stop the reflux after single injection. What about duplex? Duplex, especially complete duplex is, a, is considered a surgical indication in most centers. And we've been treating them endoscopically and we published these results in 123. These are complete duplex system and half of them have evidence of renal scarring and again we you will see the results are not as good as the uh, single system as you see 70 percent we were able to stop a reflux after a single injection others needed more than one <clears throat> what about in we you are in infants because infants are the most vulnerable patient because maximal damage as i said earlier on occurs uh, in infants, and though that's why we have been treating infants, although we also know that there's a higher spontaneous resolution in these patients, uh, but at the same time, because of the, we have a simple uh, treatment modality, we've been treating them, and this shows you the, uh, I'll show the results, 80% we were able to stop the reflux after a single injection. Also, keeping in mind that the reimplantation is more difficult, in a small bladder of infant, and also the failure rate is much higher. This is a Spanish study showed the same results as ours in infants. What about neocontral? Americans have been injecting prophylactically the other side also. If, if it's a child with a unilateral reflux, they've injected the other side. We are not proponents of those. We, we, we looked at our uh, series of a, uh, 662 unilaterally treated re patients and found only 10% had neocontralateral reflux and half of them only had grade one and two which don't need any treatment. So we do not recommend a prophylactic uh, uh, injection on their side. Now I've talked about the treatment, uh, but we still have a lot of important questions for the future. Why the disease differs in boys and girls why some patients develop reflux nephropathy while others do not? Can we predict which patient will develop reflux nephropathy? Why the grade of VUR differs in affected sibling? 
And we've been trying to answer some of these questions. And as I said earlier on, from one idea, you get the other when you have material. Now, we have the largest families with reflux in the world from one center, as you will see, and that's because of our interest. We have, uh, you know, uh, 280 families, 325 siblings, and these siblings, uh, anything for, to have two to five siblings with reflux. Uh, and our sibling of familial study was unique because we had siblings who presented with urinary tract infections. And then we had siblings who never had a urinary tract infection, who were just screened. And we could show, uh, firstly, that the vast majority of uh, our siblings <laughs> were under the age of three years, as you can see. Also, whether asymptomatic or symptomatic in Dublin study or in Irish population, our vast majority of our patients had grade three to five reflux. This is the most important slide from the <coughs> reflux point, uh, from the uh, fa families or reflux point of view. You'll see that the index patients and the patients who had symptomatic urinary tract infection, the incidence of uh, renal damage was identical. Whereas those siblings who never had a urinary tract infection, it was significantly lower at 15%, and therefore makes sense of screen, screening these patients. We were also interested to look at the influence of gender on the prevalence and expression of, the, uh, uh, of uh, and therefore we divided our patients to three groups. Group one with families who only had boys, group two who had family with only girls, and group three who had families with boys and girls affected. And we found that the sisters of index female patient had a significantly higher risk to have VUR than brothers. And boys in group one, which is only boys, had a significantly higher grade of VUR than in boys in mixed group or girls only group. Also, we found that if only the boys were affected, the incidence of duplex system was significantly higher at 15% compared to only girls affected with 5.5 or mixed group. Then we were also interested in looking at the multifactorial, especially we were interested in reflux related morbidity in relatives of patients who had reflux. Because you know, the first degree relatives have a percentage of genes, 50% common, second degree, 25% common genes, and third degree, like first cousin, have 12.5%. And we found that in our study, which we published, that there was a significant reflux related morbidity in relatives. These were the relatives who had radiologically proven reflux. 21 of these patients had kidney failure, either having dialysis or transplantation. 12 had a, a nephrectomy for a non-functioning kidney, four had hypertension, and 59 of patients, patient, mostly women, had a recurrent urinary tract infections. And you can see the mainly 80% uh, of the time, the, uh, the uh, or 73% of the time, the inher inheritance was from the mother. Oh. Naturally, we, we, we have a, such large uh, a, a number of families with, with VUR, so we became interested in learning about genetics of reflux. As I said, from one idea to the other moves. And we had over 1,000 DNA samples. And we knew that we you are a developmental disorder. So initially, before we started doing genome scanning, we were looking at the you know, known genes which are involved during the uh, uh, timing and position of formation of the ureteric bud. <clears throat> As you know, the, uh, the 
all the genomic investigations are based on the meiosis. Meiosis when the, you know, important time when the germ cell division occurs and the uh, paternal and maternal DNA material is crossed over, you know. There are two important consequences of that relevant to, to our studies. One was the sharing of DNA sequence down the generation like this. I mean, you'll be surprised, you know, these patients were coming to us, we have them, but we did not know that they were related until their DNA samples were taken. You know, one family may be from Dublin, another family from Cork attending us, but we didn't know that they were related until we got the, you know, because this is the gold mine of patients. These are for if you're especially doing genetic studies, that's where you get the maximum information. These are the type of families that one needs for investigating genetics. And the second was the sharing of DNA sequence between the sibling like this family. This is a single family. As you'll see, the three uh, family members all had patients born with, uh, you know, uh, with, with VUR. And actually we have found a lot of areas of interest of uh, genetic, uh, on genetic linkage or the whole genome scan, especially on chromosome 10 and chromosome two. Uh, again, this is another genome scan. And especially, in, we were very excited the chromosome 10 because the it, chromosome 10 in this area, there are a lot of uh, genes have been uh, implicated in the during the development or embryogenesis of urethrovocycle junction. Uh, and this is again in, in chromosome 10, we're looking at it. Our best work came out when we started collaborating with other centers. One, one was a Great Ormond Street in UK, a Slovakia, and more recently a, also from Colombia in, in New York. And when we she, if you look at this here in the UK families, we don't, there, there is a, 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 there's a peak on chromosome 10 in Dublin study in Slovakia, but not in UK. But when we pull all sample together, you see there's a major, uh, you know, uh, peak in, in chromosome 10. Uh, and this is again, uh, the, the, some Dublin families, some uh, UK families and it's Croatian family. It's, 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 it's one of the Dublin families having five siblings with a factor with reflux. Uh, <clears throat> as I said, I mean, we have published a lot uh, in, in, in relation to genetic of EUR, but these are some of the publication in the last three years, which we have made a major contribution, such as in New England Journal of Na Nature Genetics and Nature Science and Journal of, Journal of American Society of Nephrology. Now I'm coming towards the end of my talk, but the treatment, as you saw, it's become very simple with our endoscopic sting procedure. You can stop the reflux in 10 minutes. We also know now some of the you know families, as well as from genetics, we now know that you're never going to find a single gene. We're going to find a there'll be a different gene for patients with reflux nephropathy or patients with reflux who have a duplex system. Uh, so we are learning there. But even though the treatment has become simple, the diagnosis is still very traumatic. You have to put do a widening cystogram or mixturing cystogram where you are put in a catheter. You know, it's traumatic and painful for the child, but also traumatic for the uh, parents radiation exposure and a lot of pediatrician, nephrologists, radiology is quite reluctant to do this test. So for many years, I've been trying to find a, look into a, a non-invasive uh, uh, device for this. And we, we think we nearly have it. 
a, a, an R device is on a based on electrical impedance tomography. A, we already published our work on the porcine mo model where we produce reflux, and then our device were able to detect in 95% of the cases, even if there's a five mil increase in the kidney volume of fluid volume. And this is our device, which has 32 transducers. We've already done three studies with Shilpa here in three in, in, in India, one in, uh, uh, in New York. And we, uh, ha we are having a lot of significant amount of background noise problem with this, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, recently we obtained uh, 2 million uh, grant from Horizon 2020, which is the EU body uh, to, if we can, uh, to solve our problem of the noise. And if naturally, if we can uh, have this working, this will be a major contribution because it, the, the MCUG or VCUG is not a very pleasant investigation. As I said earlier on, if you are, get on to one, one topic, this, this is a, I'm just showing a VUR publication from my uh, team in peer reviewed journals, and you'll see the vast majority of these publications are in, in very high impact factor journals. But, uh, and the same thing has happened to us in other areas, you know, where my interest has been mainly in four diseases, but the more depth you go into it, you know, the more uh, promising are the results. And the, the... So let me uh, summarize what I said. As a direct result of our research, the 15 minute outpatient endoscopic procedure has radically altered the management of EUR in, in children throughout the world. Endoscopic injection is excellent first line of treatment. That's what we have been offering for the many years. We don't put them on antibiotics initially. This outpatient procedure is safe, simple, perform, and can be easily repeated in cases of failure. <clears throat> Endoscopic treatment is highly effective in eradicating high-grade VUR infants who are the most vulnerable group of patients because they develop damage early. So early intervention in these group of patients may, may uh, change its natural history and protect against renal scarring. Long term follow up shows that incidence of febrile UTIs after successful correction of high grade VUR is low. Our data supports the importance of assessing widening habits in children presenting with febrile UTI after endoscopic correction. The incidence of sibling VUR is maximal in patients under the age of three years. When VUR is discovered in siblings less than three years of age, whether symptomatic or asymptomatic, is usually of high grade VUR certainly in Ireland, the incidence of renal scarring in symptomatic sibling is identical to index patients and significantly higher than in asymptomatic. And therefore, we recommend that all patients under the age of uh, three years should be screened. R risk of VUR and severe to VUR sibling is dependent upon the gender of the child affected. Sisters of index female patients have a significantly higher risk to have VUR than brothers. Boys have a significantly higher grade of VUR than higher, uh, and a higher incidence of duplex kidney than girls. And this has implication of genetic counseling and modeling of inheritance of VUR. There's increased risk of renal cortical abnormality in siblings with a prior history of urinary tract infection, siblings with higher grade of EUR, and siblings over the age of one year. There's a reflux related morbidity among the relatives of index patients with radiologically diagnosed VUR. This information may help to counsel the pa parents about the risk of EUR and reflux nephropathy. And finally, on the genetics of EUR, I'm convinced that we're never going to find a single gene for all reflux. The, the increasing evidence to suggest that VUR is a genetically heterogeneous disorder, and we will find, a, as I said, different genes for VUR, reflux nephropathy, VUR, duplex, and so on. 
And this is a slide taken a few years ago in Dublin uh, uh, with, uh, when I had a research meeting uh, at, with so, some of my, not all, some of my research fellows who came from dip, different parts of the world. Uh, so finally, I want to finish with it. Research is fun for its own sake, but occasionally one gets extra pleasure from seeing important application and benefits as we saw from uh, uh, sting procedures. I, I was recently informed that over a million children have been treated with the uh, an, uh, endoscopic procedure that we do, developed. While it's not delusional to think that investigation may improve mankind, it most importantly is the challenge and stimulation of the true process that provides most gratification. And finally, I mean, th this is my VUR team over the years, uh, and it, you know, I wouldn't be standing here if these guys had not done uh, the lab work. And I, I like to acknowledge that. And once again, Professor Sirin was for inviting me. Thank you very much, Professor Bajpai and Shilpa. Thank you very much, sir. That was an excellent talk. Thank you for sharing your journey with us. I'll just see if there are some questions over the chat box. I think people are still imbibing what you have said. Meanwhile, may I request the seniors online to please uh, unmute yourself and speak a few words. Just raise your hand so that there is no chaos. Invite them, Dr. Gupta. Huh? Yes, Hello. Sir, Professor. Yes. Thank you very much uh, for asking me to join and. Uh, enjoy the talk. First of all, let me also have the pleasure to convey my warm greetings from Melbourne at the moment. Welcome Dr. Prem Puri to our institution. When Dr. Srinivas is at the helm of affairs, a special proud moment, not only for our department, but for our institute also. I know that uh, you always have the love and respect for our department. Only thing, this time I'm missing my physical presence there, but I enjoyed your talk as usual. And this time with added information, especially towards the end, that is non-invasive innovation to detect uh, the reflex. I'm sure that this will also come true in the course of time and you will have the uh, unique contribution uh, to the pediatric surgical community especially, that uh, they will get rid of the procedure of doing radiological investigation uh, for this uh, work. Uh, thank you, Shilpa. Thank you, Dr. Bajpay. Thank you, Dr. Srinivas, and all the audience joining uh, on this talk. We are really uh, feel so happy, uh, feeling so happy that Dr. Prem Puri uh, keeps on uh, giving the information and sensitizing uh, us, especially the younger generation with his innovations and uh, also that how the research work contributes, especially in the field of pediatric surgery, where there's a lot of scope in each discipline, each disease uh, to work on and to contribute. So with these words, I thank Dr. Prem Puri once again for coming to Institute and at a time when you will be having the celebrations on your daughter's wedding, the reception tomorrow. I'm sorry I will be missing it, but my warm greetings to you and congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Devendra. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lovely to see you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Bhatnagar, sir. Hello, hello everybody. Hello, Dr. Puri. Yes, sir, uh, we can see. Um, always a pleasure listening to, to you. Um, <clears throat> and what we've listened today is, is a wonderful exposition of uh, translational research in the true sense. 
Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us and your experiences and your research work with us. I'm sorry, I was not able to, to join you there physically because of uh, prior commitments in my medical college here. But I think uh, joining you online was, was equally wonderful. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shilpa. Thank you, Dr. Bajpai. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Shilpa's. Lovely evening. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. May I now invite Professor Bagri to speak a few words. He's been there from the beginning. This is very interesting to listen to you, Dr. Prem Puri. I still remember when you come to Ramchandra Medical College twice. Yes. You had your thing, you know, it was great. Still remember those days when once uh, Shambo called you and once uh, Ramesh Babu called you. Yeah. So I was there at both the times. And we always met in all the conferences in IAPS whenever I attended. It was wonderful to listen to you. And as Dr. Gupta said, even I'm very scared of the MCU and something new is coming up. It's really very nice to know. But one thing I want to know is the youngest baby you injected. Sure. Two, two months old, two months old. Okay. So today, antenatally, if you diagnose this reflux and the baby is born, so whether symptomatic or not symptomatic, at two months, you will inject the sting procedure, you'll do it? Well, well especially if they have grade bilateral grade five reflux, you know, mm. I, I, I would, you know. Again, depends, you know, in a, in a male, it can be, I, 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 I delay it at least till two, three months because of the instrumentation, you know, it's mm. a, although we have no much better uh, endoscopes. No, to tell you the truth, I'm so scared of the NCUG. When I was working at the Institute of Child Health, we used to children and see children just deteriorate after an MCUG. And then, you know, we had to do emergency urethrostomies to get rid of the urosepsis. It was a very frightening investigation. I would be very glad. You no, know, as a parent, I will not like my child to have this MCUG unnecessarily. So I'm glad something new is coming up. Thank you very much for all your inputs. Thank you. No, the, the, you know, that's, that's very true because the, even the parents get so frightened of these MCUGs. Yeah. So I, as, as I said, for many years I've been interested and uh, it was in actually 10 years ago, I st started this work. Uh, my first grant, uh, research grant that I got from Enterprise Ireland uh, was in 2013, and so it's, it's taken a long time for us to. Take, but I, I think we are nearly near because you, you know this. It's, it's it does work, but there's a background noise which we need to get rid of it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. May I invite Professor Sanjay Kumar Agarwal. He's the head of Department of Nephrology. He's online. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Shilpa, and uh, nice lecture. I will say only two things that number one, if the MCU introduces infection, then it is some deficiency in the department of radiology because we don't expect that the MCU should produce infection in the tract. Now, second comment is that by the time this patient comes to us in adult nephrology, role of intervention, whether endoscopic or surgically becomes controversial. So we, in adult group, uh, this is a very limited uh, experience and very limited clinical role. May I invite Professor Amle State to answer his questions, head of department of urology. I would say, I would say that even in adult urology, there is a role of uh, submucosal injection. And uh, from my own experience, I would say I have used this at least in three different situations. One is in the uh, pre-transplant situation where the patients have presented with reflux nephropathy and needing a transplant. There in that situation, re-implanting the ureter to prevent uh, uh, UTI post-transplant once the patient is immunosuppressed. If uh, the injection is given and reflux is taken care of, 
when the post transplant infection is uh, to a large extent prevented i have used it in at least two such situations with a successful outcome patients have undergone transplant later on and the other situation where i have used it is in the post transplant situation in the transplant the reimplanted ureter may be refluxing or non refluxing but if the patient presents with urinary tract infection post transplant then in that situation also if the transplant is into the posterior part of the bladder reflux a, a deflux injection or a, a submucosal injection is is technically possible but if it is the reimplant is in the anterior bladder wall where the angulation may be difficult for a submucosal injection in that situation uh, at, i have injected at least three patients successfully and one patient i have failed because of the anterior position of the transplant and the other situation in the adults where i have used it is in patients who have undergone reimplantation in childhood and have now presented in adulthood with persistent uh, reflux and uh, that also is a reasonably effective uh, simple procedure uh, quite effective with uh, the only problem that we have in india right now is the lack of availability initially teflon was available then teflon got banned and then deflux was available then deflux the utilization of deflux was so little in our country that uh, nobody was ready to import it and i don't think uh, uh, whether any agent is available right now in india for uh, alternative dexel is now available dexel is now available i haven't used one for the last maybe 4 5 years but the last i used was deflux and that also the patient had to import specifically because it was not available in india thank you sir I, if maybe if i can answer sure. uh, palette life sciences is now the uh, distributors of worldwide distributors of uh, uh, deflux and they had some problems here the not the uh, palette but the celix before had problem with the ready labs i think they were the distributor in india because they, yeah. i think they were selling it at a, a very high price you know so no pallet life uh, 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 have informed me that they are going to themselves uh, have their own office here in india yeah. thank you my first experience with sting was in 1998 where i was a general surgery trainee under professor kamisra the urologist he used to import things and put for his patients so that was a very good experience and the first uh, question full question on mc uh, ms was sting only i could answer it so i was quite happy that time may i now invite professor ram samuj um, head of department of pediatric surgery pgi chandigarh good afternoon everyone thank you i want to congratulate professor prem puri because because of this technique we have now very happy with this sting operation and we have adopted this new technique in our day to day practice and most of the our children benefit from this sting operation but it depends upon the surgical expertise and this is because in between the deflux was not available as everybody has said but now dexel is available so we are using also the dexel only thank you very much uh, professor puri for your presentation and presenting all your results including genes and the routine screening of even asymptomatic siblings less than 3 years of age that is one of the most important thing for us thank you very much sir thank you thank you Lo lovely to thank you sir may i invite dr sanjay rao the secretary of the indian association of pediatric surgeons so can you hear us professor ravi kumar good uh, afternoon uh, sir good, good to afternoon. see you you're always there in all academic activities thank you sir uh, uh very nice to hear you dr prem puri and you had been to coimbatore where when ram kumar was alive we had made arrangements in the masonic children hospital to do a few sting procedures and then all the children went home perfectly all right after the sting procedure and you did for nearly about five children at the time with varying degrees of uh, reflux and then subsequently you had also been to uh, coimbatore with uh, arnold coren and keith jogerson and others for the 
harsh prince uh, disease a single team symposium that was arranged again by dr ram kumar in the government children hospital in uh, uh, in in coimbatore uh, we recollect all the pleasant times that we had with you in coimbatore at that time uh, now the question is now uh, very difficult to get now for the past couple of years the uh, drug in the market and then the cost is also very prohibitive i am glad that you are making some arrangements to get the drug in a, a cheaper format in india thank you for an excellent lecture which gave a broad idea of the whole topic from the pioneer who was responsible for introducing this modality of management thank you thank you dr ram kumar first of all delighted to see you I'm very yeah. happy to see you and uh, and thank you very much for your comments uh, as i said daxel is available here but i think soon parrot life sciences will be having their own uh, person here in india because it's such a big market for them you know but lovely to see you thank you thank you sir thank dr sk biswas Dr. Anju Gambhir. Ma'am, you're still muted. Professor Puri, it was an honor and a pleasure to listen to you once again. Over the years, we've been listening to you and again today imbibed a lot of new things. and you are an inspiration to uh, pediatric surgeons i believe all people all over the world with the your words and as uh, secretary of the association at delhi uh, it has been a pleasure to have you here on with us on the pediatric surgery day which is being celebrated all over the country thank you sir for your presentation it was really wonderful thank you thank you very much professor simmi is also there whose name was available yeah acha hi simmi good to see you i was anyway locked into the lecture i was telling my students that uh, someone who must go for this operation and there after he had adopted it was the main concern of the management yeah thank you thank you thank you ma'am dr sk biswas sir had unmuted and then yes sir yes sir ha uh, i am also honored uh, i first met uh, professor puri in nrs medical college he was there to show us the work treatment testing to arrange for it Dr. Professor B. Mukhopat. So I am very honored to hear him again, and I am delighted. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody from here would you like to say anything? Bagga, sir, please. thank you very much sir for an excellent uh, presentation and taking us through this whole uh, uh, odyssey you know of managing uh, reflux in a innovative way you know and as you said that this this was really a journey and very few of us would really be spending a lifetime uh, pursuing two or three things so it's really an honor to be able to hear hear you uh, in pediatrics you know we would be seeing a lot a lot of reflux presenting in various forms in the times we you know we face the dilemma of whether it's significant it's actually significant uh, if you pick up you know grade 1 grade 2 in a small infant versus say grade 4 5 with somebody who's having recurrent utis uh, we often you know have slightly different approaches uh, would you have a different approach depending on the severity and the second uh, second question you know or a comment was would you manage uh, with deflux differently in a in a setting of a neurogenic bladder somebody who has really high bladder pressures and so on 
Well, firstly, the severity of reflux, I, I still uh, don't inject grade one and two unless they have renal scarring or they are getting recurrent febrile urinary tract infection uh, because there's such a high spontaneous resolution. And uh, uh, I mentioned infant high grade reflux, I will inject them because they are, you know, that's a group which get maximal damage during that age group. Uh, the the uh, neurogenic bladder, I think the main problem in neurogenic bladder is the technical because they, uh, it's so trabeculated, sometimes it takes much longer time to find the uh, ureteric orifice than to inject. But uh, because see, Ireland, uh, until very recently had a very high uh, incidence of spina bifida. So we had a lot of neurogenic bladders we've had injected. I've also injected in posterior valves and uh, also as was mentioned in the, you know, failed re-implants, you know, patients who have, uh, uh, again, especially in uh, trans-trigonal, the Cohen technique, it can technically be difficult, but you can stop the reflux. Thank you, sir. Our Dean examinations, Professor K.K. Deepak. Uh, thank you uh, for the nice talk and I'm overwhelmed to listen to this. And I'm here to thank you uh, for our daughter who's five years old then 98, 92. And uh, you are the one who uh, gave this uh, subcutaneous Daphne uh, implant. I'm, Thankful for my heart, and uh, we had a tough time. What? All right. Yeah. Tough time for one year when she kept on getting recurrent infections, and then thanks to Dr. Vigesh Bhatnagar that and other team members would remember. And after that, it was like a switch, and then we never had. And she's now 34, uh, 35 years old, and I say that 35 years this has been very successful follow up. So if she had no problem after that. She has yeah. two children. I'm really thankful. Over while I'm, yeah, yeah, great, uh, great, sir. I this is uh, I'm uh, obliged and I'm very helpful. Been talking to Dr. D K Gupta and uh, others, and I could see you in person. I've been seeing you on uh, uh, net. I will yeah. go and Dr. Pumbu. I, I know we are all family is thankful. The Thank second you. I can make point, and in fact I worked on ureter for my MD thesis. And that time the question raised in the department physiology, is it a conduit or is it an active? So what I'll do in the cat, I will stimulate hypothalamus, get beautiful patterns of ureter, three types of pattern, and could block some of the activity by phenoxybenzamine injection in the cat. The good point happened to that, we struggled to get impedance plethysmography to record ureteric activity. We were successful with ovidectal activity recording by by then, Dr. Manchanda did. So Department of Physiology did a lot of work on impedance plethysmography to record the activity. And we later on recorded activity of uh, uh, arteries, but obviously direct, or all the thoracs. So I'm very overwhelmed to see your EIT and then looking for non-invasive approach. And I'm sure this is going to be very useful. The problem of a noise is a genuine because you have several structures around intestine and other structures, which also give the same kind of a, a material uh, by which you can get reflection. So perhaps in the future lies with the giving a differential type of uh, oscillating current. You use 50 Hertz as of now, but then that kind of a give, if can, can give a, a kind of a spec structure would be helpful. So I think this is a very good future. I'm very happy to learn about the non-invasive diagnostic. Uh, so with that, so thank you so much once again. Yeah. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you, thank, thank you, you, sir. Professor Roy Chaudhary from Lady Harding Medical College. Hello, sir, Prem Puri, sir. Um, my delight to see you again in Delhi. And it's really been an honor and pleasure to hear to you again and again. And I hope you keep coming years yeah. after years and keep teaching us and giving us new insights into this disease. Uh, I, I just wonder in one point, you know, we sometimes see slightly younger, uh, slightly older children, like four or five years with persistent reflux, but they are asymptomatic. And I keep wondering whether to treat them or not to treat them. And that, that's the only point if you could throw a little bit of light. 
is it persistent uh, reflux? Is it high grade or uh, do they have? Yes, yeah, sometimes scarring? they have grade three, four reflux, but they are asymptomatic and they are thin parenchyma, as you as you see in scan and with some scars. So and they were untreated and they remained all right otherwise. So at that age, around four or five years, is it worth treating them or just observe them? That that remains a query in my mind. Well, if 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 I heard you right, you said they have a thin parenchyma, they have a scarring. Yeah, I I I would inject them. You know, I would. Yeah, sure. I think injection is a good option. I I I agree with you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. May I now request Professor Bajpayee to kindly present a memento to Professor Puri. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. May I now request Professor Bagga to please present a moment. <laughs> May I now request Professor Bajpai to kindly give the vote of thanks to everybody. Thank you very much. It was an awesome evening. Uh, thank you, Shilpa, for organizing this. And uh, with such a nostalgic journey, if you see the pediatric surgeons here and uh, Dr. Srinivas uh, having worked here, then went to Ireland and come back again, you could see Dr. Srinivas' face shining in that photograph, which uh, the, the whole fellows, fellows of Dr. Puri world over are there. And Dr. Puri, as I was mentioning earlier also, that um, as a resident, I used to see my head of the department taking you to the department very fondly. And today it was my turn to take you to the new building of the Maran Child Block. And I want to be very candid here. And this building has been there for a long time, but it's, there was some ice had to be broken. And when Dr. Srinivas came to Delhi, uh, within the two weeks, we moved there. So I think that means that today is also a Thursday, by the way, Dr. Puri. You remember that Thursday in Gaitaman Street and the Thursday when things happened, you used to read articles to Dr. Nigam. So, uh, well, it was a pleasure. Thursday and, is the academic day for gosh. <laughs> wow, that's right. So, it's a great pleasure. Thank you very much. And uh, please keep coming. And the director invites everybody for a group photograph outside the conver convergence block. Thank you all for joining. Thank you very much. We also have high tea, so please come back here after the photograph. Please send online. Sure, sir. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, our online audience. You've been really great. Thanks a lot. We'll Thank log out from here. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>